Thank you. Thank you. And uh, besides the flooding rains, it's been an amazing experience and people have been incredibly generous and supportive and I thank Mark particularly for being my host and driving me around and, and being very uh, supportive to, to get me here. And uh, this is my final one of how many of you had me do over the last week? Yeah, so excuse the rumbling voice, uh, and whoever has red wine, I'm ready for it. At the end of this, we are heading. <laughs> yes, cool. So let me get started. Um, look, I, um, as Mark said, um, I've been working in the Child Friendly Cities uh, work for quite a number of years, 25, it's showing my age. Um, and, but I'm going to show you a whole lot of things. I, you know, Mark particularly wanted me to explore some of those ideas around that work I've been doing. But I'm going to also take you um, to some more recent work where I've been theorising through post-humanists and new materials lenses. And I'm, and, and I'm still new at this. I'm grappling at it. So I hope you're generous in your feedback. Um, Nothing epitomises the precarious nature of the planet for me um, than this view. And this is a view of flying over the plateaus of the Altiplano Highlands on, you know, on my way towards uh, El Alto Airport in La Paz, um, Bolivia. A lot of the research data I'm going to talk about is from my experiences in La Paz. As you can imagine, looking at this uh, community perched on the high reaches of the valley and of the escarpment, you know, the notion of shared vulnerability and the fragility of all of us on the planet, you know, really comes to, to fore. And in a sense, it really presents for me the importance of thinking about how we can think through what are the impacts of this huge human impact we're having on the planet at, at a global scale. So the impending naming of the Anthropocene, those who know it's a new geological epoch, that acknowledges the incredible force of human impact on the planet. Um, it hasn't been named that yet, uh, it, and it's certainly not going forward without controversy and, and, and a, a number of issues. But one of the issues that I've mainly been dealing with is this, um, the notion of urbanisations. And of course, we know that cities are growing by 60 million people every year, a projected 6.4 billion people around the planet by 2050 will be living in um, cities, and that will be over 66% of the world's population of what is projected to be 11 billion people on the planet. So this crisis um, presents some enormous challenges, as I think, for all of us to address. And research and education have an important and significant role to play in that. Although contested and problematic, the concept of the Anthropocene, you know, here we are, naming an epoch after us now, sort of seems a bit of a contradiction. Okay. But keeping that in mind, what it does do, though, is it utilises the opportunity for us to come together to explore what it means um, for all of us in terms of these, you know, these long-term impacts that we're making. And it has compelled me in my own work to think about um, how I can move on from business-as-usual approaches that I've used before. So, through the introduction of these new theories, I've been grappling with the idea of sticky knots, tensions, asymmetries thrown up by the unusual and messy relations of children being with and knowing um, through the precarity of an anthropocentric world. Um, I've been involved in the Child Friendly Cities um, movement since its inception. It started in 1996. Um, the initiative was actually introduced as a response that at the time the Habitat 2 program was being presented in Turkey and Istanbul and there was a real concern by many delegates who were there that children weren't being represented in any way even though by that stage the ratification of the convention had been well and truly started to be rolled out across the world. So the Child Friendly Cities project uh, emerged out of that. And the idea was to consider how we could engage in research with children and their families in communities, in cities, to see how we could think about creating environments that were much more conducive to providing for the needs of children. And it was about engaging in, you know, sort of a cross-disciplinary conversation. So it was about getting architects, urban planners, mayors, you know, social um, delegates, together to talk about you know, what are children's needs and 
and the idea was to think about how we could operationalise the Convention of the Rights of the Child in urban environments. But the focus of it really was about implementing the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So really, what, you know, and this is just a sort of summary of what those conventions were as they were presented at that time. One of the key elements of the convention, of course, is not just about people talking on behalf of children or making decisions about how to create the best environment for them. It was also about how did you create authentic participation of children and whether or not you could um, look at ways to incorporate their ideas into the way that we might design cities to be more child friendly. Um, there are over 62 countries um, supporting the UNICEF Child Friendly Cities project. Um, thousands and thousands of cities have been involved. Many of them, many countries around the world have developed like accreditation type programs. Um, Brazil itself has 1,700 child friendly cities um, in its rural regions, 200 in its urban programs. Although a set of general characteristics of what makes a child-friendly city have been presented and different people have sort of played around with this over the years, UNICEF has always been very strong to say that there's no, no absolutes. You don't get a gold star if you can tick a box in every one of these. In fact, because of the great diversity and uniqueness of every city environment, it would be impossible to imagine you could set some universal criteria for what is child-friendly. Essentially what they say, the most important thing is that you develop some baseline data about what's going on in your city, you develop a plan of action, and you work to improve the quality against your own baseline. You know, so rather than compete against another city, it's about improving you know, from your own city's perspective what evolves from there. Um, the focus that I've taken in my work with UNICEF has always been around how to support the idea of children being co-researchers. So how can we engage children in the research? How can we research with them? And this sort of work has been focused on the idea of Im the importance of realising the subjective world of the child, thinking about children's ways of knowing and being as being different than adults, and thinking about the way that we can um, encourage this knowledge process to be part of a, an authentic research agenda and that you know children's um, experiences and the data that they collect can then be informing policy but also informing actions on the ground. So it sort of acknowledges that children are knowledge able and it obviously um, takes into account that um, that Families are also part of that, so we certainly don't do this outside of families and communities, but we always focus on the importance of children collecting data themselves, not collecting data about children, but actually collecting it, that they are doing it themselves. Um, so as a ch child as co-researcher model, what we're really trying to do is move away from the adult you know, designing and implementing and collecting all the data and actually looking at, at a participatory model where children are involved in, in all stages of the research. Um, in the research that I've been involved in, I've worked with children from, third, from three years old all the way up to you know, 14, 15 years old. Um, what we're doing is using a lot of place-based research tools that enable children to choose what they would like to do in terms of the research. So we involve them from the very beginning in terms of the questions that is um, the research is going to address. We also um, talk about the design of the research. We engage them to think about the sorts of research tools that they would like to use. Um, so we sort of have developed over the years a sort of toolkit of um, different tools and possibilities. Children have a chance then to decide which one of those that they'd like to um, use to participate or a variety of them that they might use. We, we then design a, a project around that. So we use visual methods, so we use drawings, place, mapping, photography, um, different oral and written methods, so interviews, storytelling, focus groups, um, mobile methods, so walking tours, guided tours, uh, children also in, in sort of mapping and movement and mobility and freedom maps around how they move around their spaces. Um, 
And we normally um, engage children then to analyze that data with us. So we run focus groups that where they're doing the an analytical work. Um, and normally from that, they will develop a set of, uh, depending what the focus of the project is in terms of our relationship with the funders or the government. But normally um, we've developed criteria or um, indicators of child friendliness for that particular neighborhood or that city. And then from that, we'll then look at ways to develop the data to then um, send on to the government officials. And normally that would then turn into developing a child friendly strategy or a policy or an action plan you know, for that particular neighborhood or city. In the last 10 years, um, the key sites that I've been working on, and these are the ones that I'm going to draw on in this presentation, um, in particular, the work in Kazakhstan and Bolivia, and also I've been working a lot um, in Australia, you know, I do a bit of work there because it's where I live, but um, <laughs> um, mostly the sort of communities that engage someone like me or UNICEF engages to do this work are normally um, countries that have only recently ratified the convention, so it's normally that their democratic processes in terms of their own governance is still in the making. Um, so often it's because they haven't really um, considered how to engage children in authentic participation. In Bolivia, for instance, um, you know, when we started working there four or five years ago, you know, there really wasn't a, a history of that sort of um, child participation, particularly around research and data collection. So we were doing some of the first research work around that. Um, and one of the things, as I said, is that, you know, normally we'll work with these countries and what we'll do is, um, is develop some idea around what are the indicators. So just to give you a feel for each of these sites, in um, La Paz in Bolivia, we were working with children that live in the upper reaches of the valley. So high up in, um, just before the El Alto, so, you know, La Paz is in a very steep valley. A lot of the communities that live on the upper reaches are living in very, um, transient um, homes in disrepair. They're often being built in areas where the land is left over because of its, um, you know, its dangerous um, conditions. Lots of landslides, flooding, um, and, you know, an incredibly precarious life that many of these children live in these upper areas. Um, most of the resources like schools and community centres and everything are down in the city. So, you know, a lot of the issues were around how the city council would think about providing more provisions for resources and services for these children that live in the valley, on top of the valley. Um, working in Kazakhstan, um, I've worked in a number of cities in Kazakhstan. Um, when I first uh, went there, the focus was just to have a look at what was going on in terms of child friendliness. Um, but after the first project, we continued to keep building it. And in the end, um, after five years, we developed a recognition program um, for accrediting um, cities. But the real work that was going on here in Kazakhstan was really about encouraging cities to develop some baseline data because they really had no idea. When I went into the cities to start talking about what we could do to you know, engage and improve what was going on for children, it was really clear that they had no idea, you know, what children's experiences were. And um, doing this sort of participatory research is not part of their, you know, their, their culture. It isn't something that they have much historical information on. So we were building some of that baseline data. Um, another city that I've been working with more recently was Child Friendly Dapto, a Dapto project in Sydney. Dapto is a small um, town south of the main city of Sydney. What was interesting about this project is that it was actually a greenfield site that was being developed by an urban developer. And it's the first time actually that I've managed to persuade an urban developer to think about building a child-friendly city. Normally, what we're, or community, what we're normally doing is retrofitting badly designed urban planning. Sorry to the urban planners in the audience. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, and it's taken me a long time to persuade urban planners, to, uh, urban developers to think about how important it would be to engage with children before they start building. Um, and in this particular project, we worked with um, the local primary school, with the developers. The children developed a criteria for the developers to use as their sort of 
um, mirror to make decisions around what, what and how they would develop their, their program. So it was, it was really um, uh, a sort of first in many regards. I don't think there's been many of these projects around the world where urban developers have started from a child-friendly perspective. Um, and it ended up winning the, um, the uh, Urban Planners, Australian Urban Planners um, Community Design Award for um, 2014. So that was a really great outcome. And a good, uh, uh, some good feedback to urban developers to encourage them to keep doing this. Um, another project, uh, it's not Zapto, but it's Brimbank, sorry for that. Um, this project in the western Sydney's of Melbourne, and these children were aged between three and five years old. Um, and the importance of this particular neighbourhood is it's, it's where a lot of uh, newly arrived refugees are living in the western suburbs. Um, for many of these children, you know, just negotiating um, some of these urban environments is, is new to them. They have lots of concerns around how to be safe and secure, and families are really concerned about the safety and security of their children. Um, we worked again to develop a set of criteria, but what was really interesting in this project is that the children, um, when we were analysing the data, they were talking about, well, what is, you know, what is a child's place in a city? Like, how do you, what do you call a child's place? So we decided that what we would do is try and identify children's places in the city. So they came up with the top 50 child-friendly places in the city. And then from that, we then um, went out in small groups with the kids and evaluated each of these 50 places. And so we took their criteria, which they'd already identified for us from the, the, the group, and, um, and then we went around and we visited every one of these with our clipboards and, and made um, recommendations in terms of what those facilities provided for children. And if you look at the top 20 there in green, they're actually playgrounds. So even if you just sort of get a scan, you might look and see out of the um, eight different criteria that children say the place needs to be to be child friendly, the, uh, not many of, this, of these playgrounds actually fulfilled much more than two of the criteria that children had said. And in fact, the only one that has, this one actually fulfilled six of the criteria according to the children. And this was a community playground that was designed with children. And all the rest, of course, were designed and developed and produced by the city council. So this was a really good way to show to the council, you know, like, don't, don't put any more funding in building more playgrounds. What you need to do is build, you know, make better playgrounds and, and go back and, and develop these ones that are already existing. So from that, you know, a playground policy was developed, a strategy, they then incorporated a, a, a play designer to come and start evaluating also the quality of what was there with the kids and then um, from that they started to develop a phasing of clean and developing better projects in terms of those playgrounds. But you can see even across all of these 50 children's places in the city, very few of them fulfilled what children evaluated as being a place where they would like to be. Um, and then the final project that um, I'm going to use data from is a project I did just very recently, which was called Child Friendly Rouse Hill. And this was interesting because it, um, Rouse Hill is actually a um, uh, shopping mall that's been developed in the, in the western suburbs of Sydney. Um, and it's a shopping mall um, based on principles of sustainability. Um, it's a very open um, mall, has a whole community, sort of lots of layers of urban planning. So, you know, there's um, uh, living spaces as well as, you know, shopping mall type, you know, shops and, and also a cinema and community spaces, a library and so forth. So they're sort of trying to create a, a shopping mall that becomes a village. So when we took the kids um, to the shopping mall to evaluate it, they said they were really concerned that the play spaces in the shopping mall were really bad and they wanted them improved. So we decided to go and visit all the early child care centres. We got children involved in um, telling us what a good shopping, a, a good play space might look like. And then we then um, applied that into the shopping mall. And the, the la landscape architects and play designers then used their criteria, which we can see here, as the criteria for designing the play space, which was a play space specifically for 
um, children from two to six years old. So it wasn't a general child, it was for young children. So those are the sorts of projects, very focused on engaging children, collecting data, considering how to involve children from you know, all steps along in the research process, um, always having an intention of trying to make sure that, you know, that um, something tangible came from the research, whether it, you know, sometimes it was policy, but we always also tried to do something significant in terms of building something or creating something, making you know, something in the community um, supporting children's lives. When I was doing this research and writing it up, so, you know, of course, all of us who work in this sort of domain with research, you have your, you know, your funding body who wants a research project to look like this and you research data organised in such a way for them to be able to make sense of it for whatever their needs are. And then I would always develop a children's report, so the kids would write a report which would be written for them to give to other children about what they were done in, in, involved in in the research. And then there was me as an academic going, okay, well, I've finished that. Now I can do my own theoretical work, thinking and through this research data and making sense of it myself. Um, and in my earlier days, I really focused on um, critical theory, social cultural theory, uh, affordance theory, looking a lot at the notion of place and space and how children, you know, uh, uh, cultural elements within these environments. Always um, focusing very much on the, the subjectivity of the child and then thinking about the environment as the context where children live. Um, and then I decided, you know what, I've been doing this a long time. I've always focused on the human as the only sort of central animated subject in my research. They're always central, human's always there and everything else is sort of around it. I thought, um, and then I started thinking, and of course, you know, we started to get this work coming through about the notion of the post-human, the work from Rosa Bredelli, um, also the work from Karen Barad on new materialist theories. And I started to think through this stuff and started thinking, well, and, you know, here we are in this time of real need in the Anthropocene to consider, you know, can we do our work differently? So I decided that what I would try and do is see if I could retrospectively explore some of this research data that I'd collected over, you know, 20 years of research, if I could apply some of these theoretical frames and approaches that were being, you know, um, being brought into the domain of our academic work, if I could use it to look at some of this research data. So that's what I've been doing, re-looking and, and rethinking, reconfiguring these numerous studies through the approaches of post-human and new materialism. Um, essentially, the focus of this work is to consider how I can reconsider the way that humans relate to and are set outside of nature and the more than human world. So the focus is really around decentering the human and of course, this in itself is a you know, contradiction in terms because I'm human, I collected the data, the children collected the data, we are human, so, you know. But in a sense, what I'm trying to do here is think, well, when I've looked at this data and worked with this data before, you know, I've always focused on the child as, as within a context. And I was trying to imagine what would happen if I actually um, inclu still including the child, but instead of just focusing on the child, looked at all the other objects and entities within those environments that children are in. And in not just looking and identifying that they were there, which we used to do with affordance theory, you know, what's in this environment that's available for children, but actually acknowledging that those objects and entities were animated, had some agency themselves. So actually that they were operating on the children in these contexts. So it wasn't just the child, you know, engaging with the objects. The objects were also influencing and shaping what children were doing and how they were engaging in that. So in this work, I'm challenging the notion that humans are exempt and exceptional to the ecology of the planet. And that, that was really my, my focus. 
I was, um, when I started raising Ro Rosie Brett Doherty as, you know, the post-human, I was really interested in the way she developed her thesis around the post-human ethic as well. Because I had always sort of seen myself as a deep ecologist. I studied social ecology. Um, you know, I'd always used the Gaian theory to use as my overarching philosophical worldview, I suppose. Um, and the idea being that, you know, um, that we were all part of an ecological system. But the more and more I read through what um, Brodotti had said about the post-human ethic, we start to realise that even though we acknowledge um, all the other elements within the ecology of our environments, often, you know, deep ecologists still acknowledge it through an anthropocentric lens. So the importance of maintaining the planet or not destroying is because humanity needs a place to live sort of thing, you know, like, so there is always this sense that we're working through that. So I was interested in the way that she urges us to think about the principle of no oneness in her view of subjectivity. So she acknowledges that the ties that bind us, which she says, to multiple others in webs of complex intraspecies interrelations. So that is, you know, again, that the human is not the only agent or subject in the world. And if we expose the world as a place where agency is shared and is spread more widely, humans then have a possibility of reinventing themselves into the planet. So objects, entities, animals are all acting on and being agentic outside of humans. And I think Katari does some interesting work around this as well, which was before the post-humans named it. Donna Haraway's done fam fabulous work. She does not call herself a post-humanist and she doesn't like the notion of the, of the Anthropocene either and argues a lot around that. But again, this whole idea of how we provide um, objects and entities within our environments to be acting agents outside of humans. So, um, so this is um, what Karen Barad also picks up in her book, The Meeting the Universe Halfway. And she talks about the importance of not separating um, being and knowing. Um, in these accounts of children, what I'm trying to understand is that if all objects um, have agency and, and autonomy in relation with children and that children aren't the sole authors of those relations, those relations are operating with them, beside them, outside of them, then being and knowing in this sense can't be separated because they're mutually implicated. And she, Barad, calls this idea of bringing together ontology and epistemology is onto-epistemology. Realising that it's impossible to separate knowing and being. And as I say, um, you know, in my work, I'm just a newbie in this and I'm working through trying to understand how these ideas, and I'm going to show you how I'm applying it in a minute, so I'm just laying down the foundations for you. Um, I'm also considering the idea of messy methodologies of research, which is how um, uh, Paulina Rauschio talks about this idea of acknowledging children as co-researchers with rights um, where they are listened to and taken seriously, but also recognising the limits of the subject-object binaries that we often bring into these ideas around co-researchers and participating research. And what I'm trying to do is consider how children in relation with the complexity of multiple ecologies of the world, that they're in the same way as we used to say that children aren't constituted by adults, um, I'm also trying to understand that children aren't constituted through their environments. Um, so understanding the positions of children's ways of knowing matter can be different also from adults' ways of knowing matter. So in exploring the shared world, the child, the object, the researcher, the educator, is to consider how we can meet the non-human face-to-face in what Donna Haraway calls the contact zone. To be eyeballing the other in the contact zone of child and objects, I'm enacting it through tools of diffraction. So I'm trying to understand and Barad's notion of intraaction. Um, as she's been using it in, the, in new materialism as a strategy to document the messy 
heterogeneous relations between child and materials. Um, interactions acknowledge that the object and the subject are mutually constituted and are only relationally distinct. They do not exist as separate individual elements. And that was a really interesting thing for me. I grappled a lot with the idea of interaction compared to interaction, which, you know, we've been talking about kids interacting with things for a long time. And anyone who's in an early childhood centre will say, well, you know, you, you focus a lot on children engaging with objects, picking up objects, being in relation to material things in their environments. So just to be clear about this, um, Paula Rauschio talks about the idea of interactions as the difference between interaction and interaction, interaction. She says, interaction is, is independent entities are viewed as taking turns in affecting each other, which implies that these entities are taken to each have an a priori independent existence. So what she's saying is that when we're interacting with something, we're acknowledging that two entities existing outside of each other are now coming together and having an effect on each other through this engagement. Whereas, she would say in interaction on the contrary, interdependent entities are taken to co-merge through simultaneous activity to come into being as a certain kind because of their encounter. So in other words, she's saying that just by being together, we are in relation to each other always. So it's this notion of being simultaneously co-merging through our being as entities and objects. Um, I'm also thinking about um, how I can blur the boundaries between using neat categories of certainty because I'm, I'm aware that when I used to do my sort of cultural, social cultural reading of research, I spent a lot of time developing themes. I spent a lot of times coding data and putting that data into themes and bringing it down. And even though I said I wasn't a positivist, I used positivist techniques of categorizing coding data, you know, and reducing it into these little nice bundles where I could say this is going on and this is why and this is how and so forth which in a sense then um, already starts to um, uh, not allow the possibilities of including the complexities because we're actually in a process of simplifying. And one of the things, you know, that this idea of creating open and porous boundaries around our data is to talk about the, the notion of, you know, um, learning to be this, um, this open-endedness about and actually being comfortable with that. Like we don't always have to explain it all and understand it all, but actually allow it to be more open in the way that we think about it. Um, Bruno Latour talks about the concept of learning to be affected. That requires the researcher to develop more cognitive modes of attention. I want to become attuned to the multifarious ways human and non-human bodies and entities move, affect, and respond to each other. Um, so children are always acting in relation as one, as one part of a complex array of enmeshed relations. Um, to appreciate the momentary and the seemingly unguided, mundane, benign interactions in children's everyday lives. And that's really I wanted, where I wanted to look with this. I, I didn't want to look at big, big projects of large outcomes. I, I actually started to want to look at the very um, everydayness of what was happening in my data and see how I could maybe read some of this differently. Um, often these, you know, small parts of the data that are unexplained or unplanned um, are of and um, not included in the research because they don't fit into our big categories or they don't you know, make a huge impact on the way we might be understanding this. So I wanted to have a look at it in that sort of close in view. Um, which again, I think as early childhood educators and researchers, I think this is something that we do a lot of is notice the benign, the mundane, the trivial, what others might see that way anyway, the everyday lives of children. Um, and, and so bringing a lens to that, I think, um, 
you know, through interaction allows us to see that. Um, so I believe that there's a need to embrace the idea that non-human objects um, and children encountered shared agency with and through the child. So the beads, the wooden floor, the plants, the dogs, the dirts, the rocks, the winter, the wind, the water, all of these things start to be part of the story in the pictures that I'm, I'm looking at. And, in, and just in as an example, um, through the data comes children as researchers. Um, I'm sort of retrospectively looking at the way that children are performing these private encounters in the, in the drawings and photographs that they've created for me. And, um, you know, just example from Madison. Um, my dream play space, I would have wind, water and waves and big rocks and I could feel them. You know, so that really you know, affective, sensitive um, connection that children might speak through their data with. The sorts of key conceptual ideas informing my posthumous new materials reading of childhood. So sort of just going to share with you sort of three that I'm looking at. One of the interesting things when I started to try and, you know, think about using these theories was that I made a shift from analysing my data from contextual approaches to more conceptual approaches. So the way that I had a sort of entry into it was to think about if I, instead of thinking about themes or categories, which is the way we might have analysed data before, is I started thinking about big concepts that I could use to scoop things up but not to contain them too tightly into those. So they had to be open and quite porous, these concepts. So one of the ideas that came out was, was thinking about considering material encounters as pedagogical events in which to trace the entangled world um, relations between human animals and place objects. And I've started to call them um, post-human um, pedagogical narratives, some of these sort of stories that I've opened up. Um, I've also thinking about the notion of reconfiguring entangled past, present and future relations in order to acknowledge the matter of all things as being animated agents. So this idea of you know, them having agency, all things having agency. Um, and then the heterogeneous cohabitation or the thrown togetherness, being worldly with in place, um, which is, I've drawn from the work of Doreen Massey, you know, um, well-known human geographer who talks about this notion of, of thrown togetherness of all things in oneness. Um, as a counter to the sort of Western-centric view of human exceptionalism because I'm, I'm trying to find tools that will help me, you know, move out of that. So, theorising the post-anthropocentric condition of the child-object relations through pedagogical concepts, and these are the three concepts I'm going to show you and I'm going to look this data through. So, I'm looking at encounters, relations and cohabitation. So encounters with objects, messy entanglements, being with human and the more human worlds, experiencing other agency. When you're thinking about children's place encounters, um, when I used to think about um, analysing it and using things like affordance theory, what we were really looking at was the quality of physical aspects of the, of the landscape. So we would ask, ask children, you know, there's a tree in the park, what do you do there? You know, how do you use it? Um, you know, if there's, um, you know, what sort of meanings they might attach to it and so forth. But when I'm working with this notion of encounters, I'm trying to move away from the specific um, qualities of elements and objects in the environment in terms of their, you know, affordance for children. To think about how children um, encounter them in different ways. So through these encounters with the non-human, the idea is to think about supporting children in the materiality of nature. And what I'm trying to do is think about how um, the child is being shaped through those connections with the environment. And one of the things that's been useful in trying to think through this, and this comes from Paulina Rauschia, is this notion of aesthetic affective openness towards material surrounding. She talks about this as an attentiveness to and sensuous enchantment by non-human forces, an openness to be surprised 
and to grant agency to non-human entities. And some of us in environmental education might call this a sense of wonder. Um, we've talked about this sort of idea before where children seem to have this innate openness to be able to um, look at things in the natural world in this very open way and, and, and grant them agency. But we may not sort of talked about through it in that way before. So this is a maverick. He's 13 from Copahama and he says in um, La Paz in Bolivia, he said, my favourite walk is through the forest. I'm one with the trees. I like the shade and mountain views. Um, and Logan, who says, the old farmhouse is a good place to build cubbies and climb trees because I can just be. And this one from um, Richard, who's just six years old, um, and you'll notice here, you can sort of see, he's had a, a camera, we give them um, disposable cameras. He's taken this picture, and we can see he's taken it through the window of his car, and whoever you've done this research, often the parents will take the kids on special rides just for the researcher to take you know, images of things in their neighbourhood, thinking that, you know, oh, this will show that I do interesting things with my kids, and of course the kids will say, I didn't get out of the car here, or mum took me here. You know, like the kids will, will dob the parents in every time. Um, but this little boy, um, Richard, says, I like the clouds. They look like love hearts and hold me. And he had the picture in his hand because we, you know, when we're doing this work, they bring, we develop the photos from the disposable camera and then we ask them to sort of lay them out and choose ones that they'd like to share with us. So he's picked this one out and he's showing, and this is what he said. He then, with his finger, traces um, the love hearts for me in, in, in the cloud. And this one from Lachlan. The place has beautiful nature. The mountains whisper to me in my dreams. And then a final one from Munya Pata from Rodrigo, who's age six, who says, the Illumi mountain is in this photo and a view over the city of La Paz. I can see Illumi from my house when the sunshine hits the snow and it fills me with joy. So what I started to notice, you know, when I was trying to pay attention to this sort of effective aesthetic that children were um, representing through the stories that they were attaching to these, to these images, was that I could start to see that there was a whole relationship through this that they were um, engaging with in terms of these encounters with these objects in their nature. But keeping in mind that, you know, there's a lot of Western-centric um, discourse in especially the nature education movement and people like, and I won't, Richard Liu, who, you know, who's, who's, you know, spent a lifetime talking about this idea of that, you know, if we could just take children out to nature, and parents didn't, you know, be so you know, unsupportive of their children, you know, if everyone had a canyon in the backyard where they could, you know, go canoeing, you know, life would be great and children would be different people and we'd have this wonderful world. But of course, this sort of Western-centric view, middle-class male view of the world, um, you know, is, is, a, is, an, is, is not the reality for most children living on the planet. In fact, nature is not always a utopian ideal waiting to be experienced by children. And in fact, in much of our research that we did with children, the outdoors was a very problematic place. You know, it's a difficult place for them to be. Um, and in fact, um, you know, negotiating those challenges is really central to um, the work that we do with them. So. There was also this idea of the, the open aestheticness of these environments coming through the way that they talked about it and, it's, and the difficulties they have in these spaces. This place is near my house, but I can't go there to play. It's scary. I'd like to go there, but my mum won't let me, by Peter, who's four. Um, but this one particularly, which comes from um, a child who's living in Seme in Kazakhstan, Semipelastic is an, is an interesting site because Semipelastic is a city that's on the edge of a, um, what was the nuclear testing site for the Soviets during the Cold War. So there's been 450 nuclear bombs that have been detonated not far from a major city centre. 
So as you can imagine, when independence um, came in the early um, 1990s, you know, and it started to open up to what was going on in these places, um, you know, there was a realisation that there'd been some terrible things going on and the impacts that it had on children's health and wellbeing and, and the community generally. So in my research in Kazakhstan, this was one of our sites, was to go and work with children in these neighbourhoods um, on the edge of the polygon, which is, is the nuclear site. So just to read you a little narrative of, of the children in Seme. So in Seme, this is what I've written in my diary. Um, the children realise the fragility of human and non-human life and it's linked to the contaminated earth. Children speak often of the dust, the dirt and the air the way it infiltrates everything. Um, there are dead dogs in the streets, they say, with cancerous tumours. One child, Timo, during the walk, takes a photograph of a dead dog on the street. I'm afraid of street dogs on the way home, he says. The dead dogs stink. Deformed babies, deformed dogs, dead dogs, dead babies, says one child. Do you know they have nuclear tests? Do you know about the nuclear tests? They ask me as we walk and I say, yes, I say I did know. So by attending to and noticing the uneasy child earth encounters in the streets of Seme, I started to think about this notion of the porosity of matter as well. So, um, and I think Jane Bennett talks about the notion of enchanted materiality, you know, the, the life of objects and entities outside of humans that continue on. And, I think people have been doing some interesting research around trash and rubbish and radiation from Fukushima and so forth. And the idea that objects and entities, you know, are animated, that, that they're lively and that they live out, you know, with and through humans. So these catastrophic encounters of a contaminated toxic world um, have Im impacted on the way children present the research to me in these research sites. Anna, 11 years old, she was asked to draw, um, her, you know, her dream place, the place where, you know, she would like to be. And she says, I love the mountains because there are no mountains in, I sit in the city. I love nature and animals. I'd like to walk in the mountains, which would be interesting. I want to take pictures of healthy animals. I would want to explore the underwater world. And I would want to dance because of being happy to be breathing fresh air and to be away from the pollution and the polygon. And then finally, um, also from Anna, um, I hate the dirt, it gets into your body and it hurts you. So drawing on the effective openness of children, challenging encounters of being in relation with others in cities, in relation with things like dirt, dust, air, radiation, um, could be read as an uneasy assemblage of the child earth body. You know, so. So there's two types of ways that encounters for me were being produced by children. Those where they were creating these more, you know, romanticised utopian notions and, and connections with the natural world. But then also these uneasy relations that were going on, these encounters of children with matter that was, um, you know, that was difficult and challenging. So. In the notion of relations, um, what, we're try what I've been trying to do here is think about how through the decentering of the human subject by disrupting human and the other relation be belonging to and being worldly with others. So I'm thinking about, well, what does it mean for children to live together with other entities in their, in their, um, in their environments? Um, as we know, humans like other animals know the world through moving and acting in it, through that they exist in a dynamic relational system with their surroundings and that humanity has relied on this system of human, non-human place relations for much longer than the short epoch of the Anthropocene. And, and the way we've sought to reconstitute human um, as separate and outside of nature has meant that we've often overlooked the way that we are connected in these relations. Um, I think the work of Gibson, you know, in his affordance theory, though, started us on this journey because he, his work often talked about the notion of ecological niches and the way that um, children um, might take up places in terms of their encounters and relations with, with you know, nature and the environment. But what he didn't do then is, is talk about how those material objects were then shaping children. So 
we talk a lot about the objects existing, but not how that comes back in terms of our, our encounters. So this is an interesting encounter. Um, this was in an early childhood centre as part of our research in Brimbank. Um, and again, I'll talk, read this as a small narrative. Sally, Matt and, other, and another boy, Lachlan, watch the grubs. Matt observes the grubs and explains, most witchetty grubs sniff their butts. Mark wraps a worm around his finger and says, it's tight like a real snake. Pan comes over to see what they're doing. They show her the worm snake, as they call it. Pan, sta Pan, Pan states that worms do not like being squashed. After Pam leaves, Jackie comes over. They give her a grub as well. She says, ooh, and throws it back. But she stays and watches with the others. Matt says, who wants me to kill a worm? Three children answer, me, me, me. Ed and a boy are saying, kill the witchery, butchery, um, kill the budgety boys, the budgety boys, kill the budgety boys. Ed says, every bad spider, you should kill them all. He says that they found a whitetail and Sally killed it. So this sort of violence towards the non-human world, which if you've been in early childhood setting, you probably have said, yes, I am you know, familiar with these sorts of conversations, are really, really interesting for me because they represent that sort of um, contradiction, the ambiguity around this, uh, this idea with Sally and Matt who would say, oh, we love nature. And they would bring nature in their pockets every day, worms and snails, and, but then they also want to kill it. You know. um, so they collect the grubs so they can explore possibilities, including crushing and killing worms, witchetty grubs, swinging them around to scare people, showing their power, controlling their bodily functions. And throughout these encounters, the children simultaneously love, hurt, help, free, and take captive of animals that they find in the outdoor setting. But what do the grubs do to the children? What does it mean to be a grub in relation with a child in this early childhood setting? The notion of co-merging these encounters and thinking about them as interspecies relations um, sort of allows me to consider, well, grubs themselves are doing and producing certain types of children. And in the same way as I'm producing stories about the children, then I need to be thinking about producing stories about the animals that they're encountering in these relations. Paula Rauschio says, humans are, in, in, humans are nature in relation to and constituted by all animate or an, non-animate coex, coexisting entities. So sort of reflecting on Matt and Sully's grab, um, grub relations, I'm interested to also question the notion of bad relations. And this is something that came to me um, from an Aboriginal elder that we were working with um, at the university who talked about this idea of Western human ways of knowing have put us in bad relation with non-human others. Um, and it's clear when I work with the children that learning through encounters with other species is not always harmonious and pleasant. And it's not always equal. And it does not offer often the moral certitude or simple escape from this mess we're in around our relations with animals. And of course, what I'm thinking here is that, you know, while we may go and say to a child, you know, don't hurt the animal, the worms have a life and they should be treated respectfully. We eat our meat at the table, we do, you know, and there's a whole lot of human butchering and work that goes on around what, you know, people would call as bad relations in the way we have these relations with, with um, with animals in our adult lives. So it's a complex relationship. And, and I think what this work is allowing me to do is to look at the layers of those complexities around each of the objects. Um, by reimagining in a materialist matter these mattering of a relationship, I ex seek to explore what Barotti states as the intricate web of interrelations that mark the contemporary subjects' relation to their multiple ecologies the nature, the social, the psychic. And a feature of this new ontological perspective is that it shifts conceptions of objects and bodies as occupying distinct and delimited spaces and instead sees human bodies and all other material, social and abstract entities as relational and that these assemblages of relationships develop in unknowing and unpredictable ways. 
This following set of drawings and photographs um, came from child researchers from a kindergarten in the western suburbs of Melbourne. And they were asked to explore um, their dream town. And in this one, um, Alana, she's five, says, in my dream town there are only apple trees and caterpillars and butterflies to, to eat the apples. And I asked her, and the children, and she says, they are caterpillars. Um, and Ardwa, who says, the tree is growing, the flower is growing, the thing in the grass is growing, there's a garden. But if a child wants to play soccer, they can if they are growing with the tree. This does different things to the sense of where and how in relation with non-human, and that the idea of growing with a tree as opposed to growing a tree growing and me growing as being different entities allows us to see that this is a dynamic and active relation um, this idea around the growing. And this one, um, also from Greenbank, um, comes from Caroline, and she's uh, five years old. And she drew this picture and she brought this um, drawing to me, and we were in the setting. I also had, she also had her photographs. So the first thing we did was look at her dream picture. And she says, In my dream place, I want to, I went to the park with friends, I took photos of flowers. I'm dancing now, I'm so happy as a flower. She then um, got her photographs out and, I, and started to lay them down and showed me. And sh she said to me, this is what it means of, to be in the park. So I'll just show you these photographs. So this is a sort of photo series that she's created for me. And what you can start to see through the photos, so they're all in the same place in the park, is that she's laying very close and really intimately in noticing the details of all these objects that she's you know, in relation with in the park. And then the final one, um, my dancing feet. Carolyn's photographs of being in the park illustrate her being one with her world. So she's immersed and connected into this nature child culture boundary, blurring, showing me an entangled messy thrown togetherness, as Massey says again, of, of being in one in these relational encounters. Sarah also says, um, showed me a photo and she brings this one to me and she says, I'm a leaf fallen from the tree. And I suppose at that moment she erodes the artificial separation between her and the tree and all the objects that she has in that environment. She's not really pretending to be a tree. She's just imagining what a leaf... I mean, she's not pretending to be a leaf. She, she's imagining what, what, what a leaf is. So she's not becoming leaf as such, and, which is interesting because there's been a lot of research around this idea, notion of becoming, you know, children imitating objects in their environment. Becoming animal is a theoretical strategy for the radical repositioning of the subject and it requires a form of estrangement, a shift away from hierarchical relations that privilege the human to look at another way of engaging in these understandings. So the use of the becoming animal as used by Barotti but also um, adopted from the work of Deleuze and Guattari, where they say becoming animal does not consist in playing animal, animal or imitating an animal. It's clear that humans beings does not really become an animal any more than an animal really becomes something else. What is real is the becoming itself, the zone of becoming. And this sort of goes back to this notion of, uh, of, um, of the interaction. So the zone of the becoming, the contact zone, is this space between the animals and the other and, and what um, that means. So becoming something different through us being here in relation to each other. Um, and some examples of this sort of notion of, of becoming. Um, Logan, the rough bush where we aren't supposed to go. Part of me is there, a cow. I dream of them. And another one from Brendan, who's age six, he says, I feel the best when I go and see the frogs at the river with my mum and brother. I saw a tadpole once that was almost a frog. It had three legs. Sometimes I'm a frog, so I used to be a tadpole. <laughs> and then this one from Dane, who's aged five. This is a blue whale. It's the biggest in the world. We need to stop people killing whales. I want to become a whale. 
I need to eat more. Blue is my favourite colour. My family do not like me. My mum has two babies. She has to look after them, so I need to take care of myself. But it's okay. I have a big dog with long teeth who looks after me. Exploring the human and non-human body connectivity, the embodied dynamic relational, leads me to this final concept, which I'm going to explore, which is the sort of next step, I suppose, in this sort of post-humanist pedagogy of early childhood I'm sort of thinking through. And this is the idea of cohabitation. Because I think this is, this is where we need to go. We need to be thinking, how can we co-inhabit differently our relations with others in, in, on the planet? Um, shared cohabitation with the more than human world is about, you know, animating the post-human predicament, becoming something new, being something different through our encounters and our interactions. Afrika Taylor talked a little bit about this in her book, Refiguring the Natures of Childhood, where she talked about how important it was for 21st century children to have relational and collective dis dispositions, not individualistic ones. Sorry, recording. Um, you know, to equip children with the kind of world that they um, have inherited, they'll need a firm sense of shared belonging and shared responsibility. They'll need to build upon a foundational sense of connectivity to, to this same nature culture collective. So this notion of cohabitation coming with a sense of responsibility, and if you're going to borrow from Donna Haraway, this notion of um, being in kin with others, being in com um, having other companions. Together we also must care and have shared sense of belonging and responsibility for all of our human and non-human kin. So I'll finish off by sharing with you some work I did in La Paz, Bolivia. And how I came about this was when I was doing the research um, project, after I had put together the reports and sent it off and we'd done our sort of work on the mountain, I took you know, copies of the photos home that the children had all taken while we were um, out there. And I started to lay them out and I was like, wow, there's so many photos of dogs, like heaps of photos of dogs. And when I was in the community, I did notice there were lots of dogs and I was actually surprised because must have, many of the dogs looked like, um, you know, sort of very urban Australian dogs, you know, Cocker Spaniels, Poodles, you know, which inevitably when I started to do a bit of research around dogs in La Paz, realised that these are the um, generational um, you know, offspring of, um, of colonisation. So the Spanish gentry bought Cocker Spaniels from Spain and they have now, uh, you know, taken over the hillsides of La Paz. But the interesting thing about dogs in La Paz is that um, dogs don't live with families. They're not pets in the same way that we might think about our pets. They actually live in familial relationships, so they actually live on the streets, um, but are sort of connected in a very loose way with families. And the connection actually comes through the children. So the children have adopted different dogs as, as sort of theirs or, you know, connected to them. Um, they give them names. They feed them if they can, and they'll find bits and pieces. They also, as I came to know, is they protect them. Um, they also look to the dogs to protect them as well. So what I started to think about is the idea of, what if I read the, the notion of being a child in La Paz through the experiences of child dog as a, as a single entity? And keeping in mind also that um, children in La Paz only go to school for three hours a day, so they go down to the valley um, to school, and then at lunchtime they move back up into the communities, and often they're in the communities with not many adults around. So they spend a lot of time in this sort of liminal space between sort of adult family life and you know sort of community life in the um, in the environment. So the idea of a materialist reading of child dog stories exposes the physicality of the relationships, this sort of tactile, embodied reality of knowing animals and what it means to live as a child in a one relationship with dogs. Juan hands me a photograph and describes his relationship with Coco. Juan states, Coco was my best friend. He was near me, always near me. 
Um, he was always with me. He understands the things I want. He always comes to me into the forest to play. He's my playmate. He was the same as a human friend. It was no difference between us as friends. So child dog bodies and being together in cohabitation in La Paz um, made me think about this notion of, of Haraway's kin. And she argues the stretch and recomposition of kin represents our understandings that earthlings are kin in the deepest sense. That kin becomes the purest of entities in the assemblages of human and more than human and other human. And the fact as earthlings, we have always been in kin with other animals, but in practice that we've lost our connection to these kinds of assemblages with animals. So kin relationships in this study through the children in La Paz allowed me to describe these child-dog relations. Diego, for instance, um, talks about, um, I've taken a number of photos of stray dogs, the ones who often accompany me, he says. Diego holds me a photograph where I can see a dog high up on a roof all alone, and he explains. The photograph is a dog that I take care of because it doesn't eat. The dogs are badly treated and people beat them for no reason. He pauses, a bit like the children. Sometimes we hide on the rooftops to be off the street with the dogs. The other photograph he hands me, this is the dog that sometimes gets beaten. The streets are dangerous for us, children and dogs, I mean. So cohabitation with and through multiple ecologies, you know, how do we support the notion of environmental concern and responsibility as expressed by the children as a said, shared sense of an ethical investment that children have to this collective interaction that they have with the multiple others that they're on the planet with. And finally, this one from Diego who says, I want the world not just La Paz to be a better place so there is not so much poverty for children or dogs. I want parks and places for everyone to play. Through these photographs and stories, um, what I've, you know, I'm, I'm still grappling, I'm still trying to make sense of it. I'm still imagining what, you know, what cohabiting with animals might look like. And what's interesting for me is that the children are giving me um, openings to be able to explore this. So by noticing and attending to some of these relations, you know, at the very everydayness of their lives, I'm trying to think, well, can we attend to some different ways of interconnecting in the way we think about ourselves in relation to the more than human world? So by applying a post-humanist and new materialist reading of these relations, whether it's beads, grubs, dirt, mountains, leaves or dogs, I'm considering um, that there is a potential to extend the notion of ecology. So I want to move beyond what was my deep ecology perspective to think about um, an ecology that's beyond a hierarchy that has a human at its pinnacle to uncover a, a whole world of new material relations where humans are no longer exempt from the consequences of the Anthropocene. But that's not to say, you know, I want to support a heroic story of humans, um, but that by rethinking through my research, what I'm trying to bring to the surface is that in this discussion about the Anthropocene, how important it is to include children's voices and children's experiences. And in fact, um, through you know, a pedagogy of, uh, of early childhood education that focuses on the post-human, that we may even be able to consider new ways of extending these ideas of nature education, environmental education, sustainability education, um, and what that might mean for the planet if we're thinking through um, this in a different way. So shifting away from, as I'd said earlier, this business as usual approach that we've had, which, you know, I feel as an educator who's been in this field for, you know, a long time, that we really haven't come up with anything very new and maybe we need to be looking outside of what we've been doing for something new. Now, whether post-humanist, new materialist theorising is going to be that or whether it's just part of the journey of us disrupting the ways that we've always been. I think, you know, this gives us some useful tools. And there's certainly a lot of people now who are starting to think about, well, what are the consequences of this 
to think differently about our education. So the impact of urbanisation coupled with such global phenomena as climate change, toxic contamination, waste, natural disasters, war, poverty, um, you know, what will this mean for the many communities and who will face significant barriers to ever developing sustainability, you know? I mean, I was there um, uh, at a conference um, a year ago when we were discussing with UNICEF, you know, what the new sustainable development goals would mean for UNICEF and children's rights, you know? And I couldn't help but feeling like, oh, here we go again, another set of, you know, human-focused goals with, you know, we're all going to be evaluating, collecting data, standing against, you know, but really uh, many of these countries, you know, in an unpredictable, precarious world, we're not even sure what this world's going to look like. So I'm not sure it's enough just to keep developing evaluation. The only way forward for many will to be embark on a process of rethinking how to address the impacts of the Anthropocene and consider new ways of being with the planet. So I believe we have much to learn, particularly learn, learn outside of this romantic view that we're often being espoused around children's relationship with the environment. It's more than taking them to the forest or going to the beach or doing nice things. I think we need to look at the gritty in encounters children have, the not so harmonious, the things that make us uncomfortable because I think in those spaces we can start to see something differently. Finally, through this work, the urgency leads me to grapple with the ethics and consequences of not listening to children and not including their voice in this discussion around the Anthropocene because they have much to lose, maybe the most to lose. Um, you know, it is their future. I hope we can all consider together how to view the contribution we can all make to Princess's dream for a human and non-human friendly world. So I'll finish off with Princess who said, this is my dream of a child friendly world, a world where children and animals are free. So thank you. And I don't want to be self-promoting, but hey, it's a neoliberal world we live in, but <laughs> no, um, I've been exploring these ideas and I'm um, just in the middle of publishing a book and, and a lot of the, I've passed on some of the draft chapters from the book if people are interested to look at how I've, you know, done this in a bit more detail. Um, you're most welcome to, to uh, contact Mark and he'll pass on some of those publications for you. <laughs>